India's biggest food leaders, best food philosophies, genius culinary minds converge right here to share their master strokes for success. Welcome to Secret Sauce. Uh, Chef Vineet Bhatia, thank you so much for speaking with us. So let me start off by asking you about your universe or your empire as it were. You manage 11 restaurants around the world. How do you divide your time and do you have a favorite or not so favorite? Well, they're all like your children. Uh, we do run 11 restaurants globally and majority of them are actually in the Middle East. Mm. Uh, so they're quite centric. Uh, we've got London as a flagship, we've got uh, Geneva, Zia, the Mumbai here, Mauritius, and the rest all on the Middle East belt from Dubai, Bahrain, Doha, uh, Qatar, and uh, Saudi Arabia. So a lot of my time actually goes around checking all the units, mm. like a QC, order check them to see how it is progressing, what is happening. Mm. Uh, training is very, very important. Uh, menu changes. So, so if squeeze. you have a, like a cockpit view uh, of your 11 restaurants, what are the red flags or not red flags that you're looking for on a weekly or a monthly basis? I mean, you have a world map. Mm. That's what you will get. You see the, the home. Mm and then you see the various outlets where they are and each one is linked to a webcam so we can actually go and log in wherever we want but what we get is we get reports on a daily basis mm. from every restaurant we have on the, the daily sales summaries, the average checks, who's come and dine, who are the VIP guests, mm. who are the sunshine guests uh, by the way sunshine means who are troublemakers mm. so okay. we've got to be careful of those mm. but these are all internal uh, codes you use mm. and you try and track everything where it is mm. uh, any glitches are very important because mm. glitches really spark up straight away. Mm. And you so give me know. an example of a glitch that you faced in one of the restaurants recently and what you Okay, uh, papad. Mm. We had in Saudi and English literally what three days back, they found a hair in the papad. Mm. And uh, we got on and said, what is wrong? Why is there papad? Why is there hair in the papad in the first place? Because you all wear hair nets and you're all working with all the mm. uh, health and uh, safety things. It shouldn't be happening. And they found out that the batch which had come actually had hair inside. Mm the local brand from India. So it could happen, things happen. So what do you do? So the basic thing we tell them is, open the packs, before you cook the packs, you take it up, put it up against the light, and they get translucent. Mm. So you see, mm. you physically stand and check each mm. part. You can't, mm. you can't just bend the whole lot. And it was such an odd thing that that packet of that had like six of them had uh, hair in them. Instantaneous reaction is very important and just saying, brush it under the door or the carpet, ke ho jayega kal. Mm. It doesn't work, it has to be now. I mean, although we have webcams and we check, but we also have uh, Skype, we also have WhatsApp. Mm. So, you know, we get images sent to us. It's a connected world, and I think the connected world is helping you run, is very important. run your so business. No, my it. phone is more like a pacemaker for me. Mm. It works like, uh, it's my extension. The communication is extremely important, and that gives a very clear message across the board to everybody that we are accessible across continents. Right. Anytime. The connected world or 11 restaurants, all this was far from your mind when you were a young boy. You wanted to become a pilot, but you couldn't. Uh, how did you get into catering or, or, or hospitality first? Purely by error, by mistake. I was a reject. Mm. I wanted to be a pilot. I grew near mm. Jew Aerodrome, near the airport. Mm. And every morning the Gulf ADC-10 was my wake-up call. Mm. So I knew all the aircraft signs, I knew the timing, where they were going what was happening and my passion was engines and planes and aircrafts uh, sadly couldn't make through uh, my dad was in the textile industry mm. exporting cotton so dad said uh, go to Sasmira and Varli and maybe mm. I can help you somewhere I went to uh, Sasmira for a week and that was not my cup of Darjeeling at all I couldn't stand the noise I couldn't stand the, the smell of the cotton and I said uh, all over my face I said nahi hone wala and, and I said I apply for engineering so go through for engineering and lost a uh, few marks on percentage and I was offered, I think, Kolhapur or Sholapur, mm. and I had to pay one lakh donation. Mm. Yeah, capitation, those were the days. I refused. And mm. I said, I am not paying. Two things I'll never pay for is uh, anything, capitation fee, mm. or to pay to see God in the temple or mm. a mandir or wherever. Mm. I refuse. Mm. I think this should come as it is. Uh, so refused to do, and they said, what will you do? And I said, I had a call from hotel school. Mm. And in 85, in, in, U, in India, there were 11 colleges, IHMs, government colleges. The course began in July. Mm. We received telegram in October at 2.30 in the morning. You know, at 2.30 in the morning, a telegram, something is not right. Yes. Somebody has gone mm. or some bad news coming through. And Chokidar came and said, Saab Taar aaya. So we all got up, okay, what happened now? And they said, admission into hotel school in Ahmedabad. And he said, okay, put it down, go to sleep. No one was bothered. Mm. So we all went to sleep. Got up next day and I said, kya karna hai? I said, yes, I'll go to Ahmedabad. Mm. And your parents were fine with that? Not nobody was fine with that. Hmm. You know, they're all into their doctors or their engineers or they are something else, professionals. And 
और फर्स्ट ग्रैंड चाइल्ड वॉन्ट्स टू गो टू होटल स्कूल एंड फर्स्ट थिंग से टॉयलेट साफ कराओगे बिस्तर बनाओगे झाड़ू मारोगे खाना पकाओगे एंड ऐसा यस पकाऊँगा करूँगा एंड सर ओके दस फोर्ट यू वो दस फोर्ट यू डू आई श्योर एंड सर यस वो एक्चुअली वेन टू अहमदाबाद एंड डिट माई फर्स्ट ईयर अहमदाबाद आई वॉज द लास्ट पर्सन टू जॉइन आफ्टर थ्री मंथ ऑफ द कॉलेज आई जॉइन आई वॉज नॉट द फर्स्ट लिस्ट सेकेंड लिस्ट आई वॉज द थर्ड लिस्ट नंबर सिक्सटी एट आई वॉज द वेरी लास्ट पर्सन टू जॉइन आई आई डिट एक्सट्रीमली वेरी माई फर्स्ट ईयर एंड आई बिकॉज यू डिट वेल अकेडमिकली यू आर अलाउड टू चूज द ट्रांसफर एंड आई चूज टू कम टू बॉम्बे बैक टू बॉम्बे सो आई केम बैक टू बॉम्बे टू दादर कॉलेज होटल स्कूल सो दैट इज वे माई जर्नी केम बैक इन द इंडस्ट्री वॉज इन मुंबई and when i came back to mumbai uh, as part of your training you had to work into a hotel and i wanted to work in a bar mm. and make cocktails and drinks mm. i love the colors i love the vibrancy of the stuff so i applied at opera towers here which is now trident mm. and i said uh, i wanted to apply as a summer trainee and i want to work in a bar and they said you're too short to stand behind a bar they'll hardly see you in the bar mm. so they asked me to train what do i do he said uh, you only fit to go back of the house so we we'll put you in the kitchen So I was put in the kitchen, and I said, "Okay, okay, I'll go in the kitchen, and after a week, ten days, I'll bring it out, go into room service or banquets, do some service, and get back into." Service. So at that point, you were still not clear that you could be a chef. No, no, I had no idea. No, okay. I used to. I, I did so not. So you already spent more than a year uh, in, in school. In school, but yeah. I had no interest in kitchen. Hmm. I used to barely pass my exams in the kitchen cooking schools. Hmm. I used to remember to be a. Uh, A cooker here, a cooker there. So, and two guys used to work each side. So, we used to watch what the guy was doing and try and copy him, <laughs> just to make sure we passed the exams. Mm. But you asked me about beverages. Mm. You asked me about the service side. I, I was excellent. Mm. I knew everything. I could manage the stuff in my curriculum. So, we were asked to report at morning seven o'clock in the kitchen in uniform. So, I got there at six thirty in my uniform. And when a chef came in, they all lined you up, and he would come and check your nails. He would check your hair. He would check your scarf, your uniform. And if it's not right, they will send you home. And that's the first thing I saw. Discipline. And I said, I love this place. This is beautiful. And that's when it struck me. And I said, I want to learn to cook. And I think you've been quoted saying that uh, great chefs or chefs are not uh, are not born; they are made. It is a hard graft. Hmm. You know, we always tell all the young kids coming to us that when you start your career, it is a good eight, ten years before you can crack it. Hmm. So till 27 hmm. or 28, you're like a sponge; you're absorbing. Hmm. So when someone comes to me and says 23, 24, I am an expert. I am an initiator. I said, go back, mm. learn to cook. Still, you still have a while to go. Mm. Those eight, ten years is what you put in mm. is your basic foundations, mm. and that sets your soul right. or your character in terms of as a chef or what you are. Mm. So you need to work with people who are in the industry who know what they're doing, mm. and who have the right etiquette and mannerism and are professional enough and disciplined. to impart the knowledge to you right so, so I, what what would you say those those some of those knowledge i mean those some of those learnings are for instance discipline clearly is one and i'm sure that's what how you run your restaurants today but what were the other learnings in the first few years uh, passion the passion inside is junoon mm. that this is what you want to do mm. is your belief of what you are mm. and where you want to go so passion is an ingredient that you actually you learn around you yeah and you know it comes out of your own interest Mm. And so it's a developed passion it's, rather than a. It's a developed passion, yeah. you know. I mean, uh, if I had got through for uh, an airlines mm. or into an uh, to be a pilot, I would have been the probably the, the best jet pilot ever. Because yeah. I knew I have excel. Because that was my passion then. Mm. So I realized I was not going to fit in there. So I need to have an action plan B, something to do. Mm. And I just fell into the kitchen. And in those days, everybody mm. who went into the kitchen. was either who was a failure of some sort or who could not get into iit or a doctorate or engineering and went some to something else or even if you can't into bcom ba they mm. went into hotel mm. school because you know all the rubbish guys were sent in there sadly mm. i was one of those but you know even having gone into the kitchens then everybody wanted to go into french restaurants mm. or italian or mm. bakery and pastry or mm. something nobody wanted to do indian mm. because indian kitchens were considered the worst to work with Uh, you work with all the illiterates unfortunately but how did you take that contrarian contrarian call at that time i mean how did you i did in them purely because i wanted to learn my art mm. and i realized that if i have to do something in my life mm. i didn't want to sit in the chair of the executive chef mm. that didn't bother me or interest me at all because i wanted to learn the craft so do you com- concluded this because you were looking at someone as a role model or is it something that you felt i was looking within? at things around me okay first thing i picked up was the guy sitting in the office or the senior chefs mm. don't do any work they just sit there and they have a tea coffee and they instruct you what to do mm. 
and you know that is not correct mm. if you want to lead a team you lead by example mm. so i knew from day one if i had to do something i needed to learn indian khana and i used to work, i used to train at a french kitchen i had to train mm. and you could see they were doing like 15 seats and 20 covers a night and you have indian restaurant doing 70 and 80 covers on a full packed house and there was a mad rush and everything is going on and you guys are sitting there and doing little bit of work and little plating and playing around and passing your time but those were the guys who were actually making money mm. for the hotel not you mm. but they were getting the prestige and not the indian guys mm. and i did not like that mm. and i said what you're doing here we should be doing there sitting in india and making that even better mm. why does everything have to go into a brown stew and into a bowl and why does it have to be like that why do you need half an inch of oil on the plate mm. why do you have to have a gulab jamun which are sugary sweet and then you fall sick i should question it mm. and i should be told please shut up you don't know what you're doing this is the way it is done and that's the way we cook our food we do not touch it right so two quick questions so one is were you want, wanting to focus on indian because you felt patriotic or is it because you wanted to be different or what was driving that i wanted to be different mm. patriotic is besides sorry i am still patriotic though i don't live here anymore but i'm still very much indian at heart mm. Now it remains in our heart. Mm. So, but you are saying so. Therefore, it was driven out of a desire to be different. Yes, and now yeah. why different? So, when I went in the industry, I knew to excel, I had to do something very different, which nobody else could do. Mm. And that is my USP. Mm. And that makes me different from everybody else in the market. Mm. And nobody can catch you on that. Right. Because you are hotke. Mm. So, the other point about passion, and I do want to come back to that. So, you said you did have to inject passion into yourself. Mm. How does one do that? self motivation discipline hmm inner belief yeah that is what you do you talk to yourself you tell yourself hmm and what happened to But me but you're telling yourself that i'm going to like this though i have no history of liking it you begin to like it yeah you keep saying that 10 15 times i love this plate you know i love the plate i love the plate hmm. you end up liking the plate but then you need to be sure yourself what you want to do hmm so even if you don't like a certain thing you'll have to learn to like it So at what point did you stop have to I mean stop having to sort of convince yourself and at you know it became a natural uh, affection or I think when I came uh, in the industry within 6 8 months I knew exactly what I wanted. Okay. The first year I was all into F&B mm. and second year when I went in I came into food and I knew straight away that's mm. it that's what I want to do It's because I wanted to learn the craft. Right. I wanted to learn the art. Mm. I wanted to master the way of cooking mm. the things. Right. So I would spend all my extra hours on weekends working into kitchens. So you felt like you were racing against time? I mean, yes. Okay. I still am. Hmm. <laughs> the race is always yeah. on. Yeah. But for me, it was uh, the Indian cooks inherently are very lazy, hmm. and that worked to my advantage. And why is that? It's pure habit. Calm, tal do, short cut, mar lo, jhatka laga do, like this in the industry, and let it go. Hmm. Chalta hai. Hmm. You know, chalta attitude is bad. It's not going to work. Hmm. But sometimes you also need to learn the chalta wala kam hmm. because the short cut comes handy when you are stuck in situations. Give me an example. Uh, we were at Obroy's here, and uh, we had a function going on, and it was for 700 guests. And the number of covers jacked up from 700 to 1500, you know, doubled up, mm. literally. Now you, you always have an allowance for around 15, 20 percent of mm. people to go up. 700 can become 800, 900, and you can manage. But when it bursts up to 1500, then something has gone wrong. Mm. You know, it goes haywire right from the service side to the kitchen mm. side, and for the food fell short. Mm. We had a chart counter, and there was no imli chutney. दे वो मिर्ची चटनी चटनी खत्म हो गई व्हाट डू यू डू नाउ टू मेक अ मिर्ची चटनी इट टेक्स यू टू आस सो आई एंड एंड अप ओपनिंग अ कैन ऑफ डब्बा ऑफ मैंगो चटनी पुटिंग इन सम रेड कलर पुटिंग इन सम चिल्ली पाउडर मसाला जीरा पुटिंग इन गरम पानी एंड द ब्लिटसिंग इट अप विद अ बिग हैंड ब्लेंडर इन मेकिंग इट लुक लाइक अ मिर्ची चटनी दैट्स द यू कांट टेल द गेस्ट के आई डोंट हैव अ मिर्ची चटनी एंड यू गिव टू द गेस्ट इट मैंगो चटनी एंड इट इट फ्लू इट फ्लू ओके So, why did you left in '93 and you went to London? I mean, I've seen a lot of your contemporaries follow a similar path. Why did you do this? I, I was pretty uh, frustrated here in India. I wasn't growing as a chef, mm. and as an Indian chef, you're trying to uplift the cuisine, mm. and you were slapped in the back and says uh, doesn't work. Mm. So I was cleaning my food off mm. internally myself, mm. and I was told regularly that this is not going to work. You should not do this, and you know it becomes very embarrassing at times because you see your counterparts, your peers. Are excelling and they're doing well in that foreign cuisine in your own land, and you, as an Indian, can't do it there. And so I said, that is it. I need to go, mm. and I left. So 93 is when I left. I went to UK, and when I went to UK, I had four options at that time. I had uh, Tokyo, I had Bangkok, I had Dubai, and I had London. 
I chose London mm. to go. And not because I knew the food scene in London. I purely chose to go to London because of two things. Mm. One was the cold weather mm. and it rains around the year. And second thing was Heathrow Airport. Mm. I could see planes. Mm. And when I went to London, all I had in my pocket was seven pounds. Mm. I didn't borrow money from anybody. I said, that's all I have. And I had two bags. I had one bag of clothes and one bag of books. I mean, my, my phone has got the note section and it's all got my, my menus, my ideas, my flashes. Everything goes there. There are 6,000 images on my phone. They're all food pictures. Mm. So what was the first hurdle that you hit in London? I was the only Indian in the Indian restaurant. Mm. And that hit me first. It's a nice restaurant, but there's nothing Indian there. Mm. The staff is an Indian. And the staff are Bangladeshis. Mm. I had things on the menu which I, I was to get shocked. I said, how do you even do that? But that is what they've been doing for the past 30, 40 years in mm. London. Mm. But they wanted to change and that's the reason why they got me in. So when I walked in there, the first thing I did was I kept a moustache because I was 24 years old, mm. just so I look old. <laughs> so when they asked me, so how old are you? I said, I'm 31. <laughs> just so that they didn't say, bacha nahi aage. Because I've seen that in the past, mm. ke kal ka bacha aage, khana se And they were all senior to be in age. Uh, I started changing the menus and the first thing you cook as a chef, is something sweet, mm. as an offering for the gods. Mm. So I remember it was Sunday, we made gajar ka halwa, I made it for the staff, and we also gave it to one of the guests who came and dined, an old English gentleman, and it was the gajar ka halwa, sun it up, we served it to him, he took a spoon and he said, this is rubbish. Because it's cold? It's hot. Mm. Because you served it hot and he likes it I served it, it cold. hot. Yeah. So no, he said, uh, I went to see him and he said, this is not gajar ka halwa, you don't know how to cook. He said, Gajar Kalwa must be served uh, ice cold mm. into a cube and into a bowl. And you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, is fat, is ghee, is slow cooked, how do you eat cold ghee? <laughs> but that is what they were used to. The second thing I did, I still remember, was the Rogan Josh, Nandi Rogan Josh, Kashmiri style, on the bone, the lamb, the shanks of lamb, served it to the guest, and uh, promptly he was sent back, he's saying, I'm a dog, I'll eat food on the bone. But those were the days people did not know. Bringing about change is, is, I guess, one of the biggest challenges and opportunities for chefs like you. How do you push forth, push something like that and push that all the time? Because I'm assuming as you get older, the propensity to take that risk of bringing about change decreases. We all are happy in our own space and time. It, it, what makes you happy? Hmm. Uh, me as a person, I'll never be happy with what I do because I try and look for the next one. Hmm. What is not right? I mean, I do dishes there and I, I, I document them down. We take photographs, we do the tasting, and we, we approve dishes and we give it off to the guest and it goes on to the menu. And when I come back and I revisit and I said, this is not correct, something is missing. So you try and find a balance again. Mm. You try and tweak, you mm. try and improve. So that's a constant quest to excel, mm. to find that balance right. Mm. How can I make a thing better? Because the day you say, okay, this is the perfect dish, that's the way it's going to go. Mm. Then you stop like thinking. for instance, I mean, you're the first Indian chef to get a Michelin star. Mm. So, I'm assuming again, once you get that, there is pressure not to change too much after that because in some ways you're saying, okay, I've been rewarded or awarded for this, so what I've done so far, mm. and maybe this is the formula for life. Mm. Does that, I don't know whether that thought ever came well, to you. No, it never came to me. I'll tell you why it didn't come to me because uh, see Michelin is all about consistency mm. exactly, and quality. Yeah. Mm. So, you're right in a way, if you have a a perfect formula which is working, why change it? Mm. I cook for people who come and dine in my restaurants. And if I can produce things which are beautiful mm. and which work well, mm. I want to take it further. Mm. And for me, experimentation and evolution is very important because that is life. Mm. You know, even a, a graph has ups and downs. Once it goes flat, you're dead. Mm. So no, your, your food is about you. Mm. It's about your passion. Mm. So we constantly push the boundary. What next? How do we push further? What do we now look at? What ingredient do we look at? Mm. What trend can you start? What, what uh, plating style can you do? How can you design a certain thing? How can you make your service sequence better? How can you make the guest experience better? Mm. It is all the next step. Mm. And that keeps you ahead of your competition. Because you know now, everybody is so social media savvy that you put a picture onto your Instagram page and it, everybody sees it there. Yeah. And I've seen images of my food being sent back to me saying that I have So you mentioned competition and that's an important, I mean it plays an important part in all our lives. So how do you separate competition from innovation of your own and where do you sort of draw the line and, and where do you stop and where do you... See competition is very healthy, it's nice to have competition and you know, but what you do is you compete with your own self first, then looking at somebody else's restaurant to see what he's doing. Mm. I know what I'm doing and I want to do it better. 
So if I am doing my stuff and I want to make it better, I don't want to look outside to see what these guys are doing. Hmm. I mean, I look at images of food from people around the world. That doesn't mean I'm copying something from Latin America because I can't cook that food hmm. or something in Fiji, Australia. That's not my cuisine. But if I look at a plate of food, I analyze the plate of food. I said, that looks nice. Hmm. Why does it look nice? Is the plate very nice or is the food very nice? Or the elements of colors are nice or the way it is presented is nice? So you try and take those things mm. and you put into your mind and you absorb and you try and do something which is your own. Mm. In a normal 24 hour day, what are you looking at and what's kind of influencing you or perhaps not influencing you? I mean, you could also see some things and say, okay, that's not something that we should be doing. Mm. No, it happens. I think for me, you know, as, as, a, as an artist, uh, the two things which are very close to my heart is my family first and then it's my business, my food. And for me, it's all about a guest satisfaction, a guest experience. You have to put yourself in the shoes of the guest to realize what he wants and then deliver it to him without even being asked. Mm. And that is good service. So when you go to a new city or new place to open a restaurant, what we first do is a recce. We go around the city and just feel the pulse of the place. We get to see the landscape, we get to see the architecture, you meet people and you break bread with them. Mm. You get to know what they are about. You get to know their culture. You know That holds you well in your business meetings yeah. because you understand, you link. And you take those elements and you try and put those into the cuisine, which is your native Indian food. But you add a certain element of cuisine which belongs to that land. Mm. That is what we do with food. We try and take certain elements of those places and incorporate that into our food and give that a little respect and touch. And, and that in some ways I guess is a, is a lesson in, in marketing as well. I mean, you know, how do you actually position your product and how do you, you know, connect with your consumer? No, you have to connect. Particularly when you're, it's a trans, I mean, it's a global product that you're bringing to a new place. Yeah, I mean, your connectivity is very important because, you know, you have to have things around you which you can, they can relate to. Mm. I mean, you know, on, on a menu, say, for example, you have a samosa. Mm. Now, everybody knows what a samosa is. You know, when you go around to a place like the Middle East, the last thing you want to do is do a samosa with potatoes and peas because that's too common. Every restaurant probably has it. Mm. So you want something very different. So you end up taking... A Chocolate. Uh, Chocolate came <laughs> different the challenge, but say you're sitting into a place like Middle East and you want something a local flavor. So you you take feta, you mm. take olives, you take zatar, mm. and you incorporate that into a filling of a samosa and you serve it to a guest mm. and he eats it and he says, "I'm getting my Arabic flavors. Mm. I've got my black olives. I've got my feta or I've got my uh, zatar or the sumac." You know, I mean, they suddenly say, "Wow, mm. you know, it is nice." But it's got my flavors to it. Mm. So you add and your haldi masala and your dhania, pudina and to flavor it. But you know that little, little touch here and there, mm. that makes it very centric to where you are. Right. The products are very important. Right. Chef, we're running out of time. So, you know, this show is called Secret Sauce. So, may I ask you, you know, when, as you look back at your career, what are the elements that, what are your secret sauces? And I'm not talking about food ingredients, but I'm talking about you, the person, what drives you. That your secret sauces that have actually made you what you become and perhaps and more importantly will take you from here onwards i think most importantly you need to have a, a strong passion you need to have an inner belief in what you are and you need to be extremely honest to yourself more than anybody else if you're not honest to your own self you know you're not you're cheating yourself so you need to know exactly what you are as a person and how you are and what you want to be and then you focus in a way that you try and achieve that goal through a very clean path. I think the last thing you ever do in any field is tread on other people's shoes. And that we never do. So it all boils down to your passion, it belongs to your belief of what you want to do and you have to be extremely honest to yourself and critical about yourself. Right. And in that process, I mean, you know, in fa facing failures, I mean, and how do you pick yourself up once again? I mean, a failure could be a specific restaurant, maybe a, 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 a guest who's upset with you and badly so, mm -hmm. or an entire project going wrong. So how do you... I think failures are important because it also gives you a wake-up call that something you're not right, mm -hmm. that something you've done is not being correct or not being appreciated well. So most people will be very arrogant and say, this is the way I do it. You either like it or you lump it. I mean, I look at it differently. I said, okay, something has gone wrong. What has gone wrong? You try and analyze. Is it because of something which I have done? Has it been the guest experience or is it his personal taste? And then you try and rectify it. So, you know, you learn from your mistakes. And we all make mistakes. So, you know, on a daily basis, we make mistakes. But we have to learn from them and not repeat them as mm -hmm. far as possible. If I look at a plate of food or if I look at a service and something is not right, I will criticize it and answer why it is not correct and how you can improve it. Because criticism is only good if it is constructive. Mm. Otherwise, don't criticize. 
Right, Chef, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for speaking with us and sharing your thoughts. Pleasure. It was a pleasure, pleasure. meeting with you pleasure and talking to you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.